Very well. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the EGPP seminar series. We are ready to start. For those who join us for the first time, my name is Daniele Caramani, and I will be chairing the session today. The EGPP seminar series combines various types of seminars, and today's session is a book uh, presentation. We are very fortunate to have the two authors, uh, professors Catherine De Vries of Bocconi University in Milan, and uh, Sarah Hobolt of LSE, and authors of an important recent uh, work. Um, the title of the book that we're going to uh, discuss today is Political Entrepreneurs, the Rise of Challenger Parties in Europe, published by Princeton uh, earlier this, uh, this year. And we're very happy that we're going to be able to engage in a debate on their findings and core uh, argument. The book is receiving a lot of attention and we are delighted to be able to debate its contents with both of you. Due to COVID restrictions, we hold this session. It will be an engaging and stimulating seminar nonetheless. And I very much look forward to it. I want to thank you uh, uh, both Catherine and Sarah for accepting our invitation and for being with us and taking the time to present uh, their work. In terms of format, Catherine will give an initial presentation of about 30 minutes and then both authors will take questions and comments. I understand that Catherine needs to leave us 10 minutes before the end. So uh, 10 minutes before uh, 2 p.m. due to another presentation. To those attending, please keep your microphones muted, but the video switched on if possible. During Q&A, you can use the hand uh, function on Zoom if you want to make a, a comment or ask uh, a question. Thank you all for being with us today and especially to our two speakers. Uh, Catherine, please, uh, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much. You guys can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm sharing the screen that you can see it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I will try to do it in 30 minutes. It's uh, I've not always succeeded. So if I go a little bit over, if that's okay, uh, but I'll really try, uh, try to do it uh, because it's a book in, uh, in a short presentation. So I'll try to do it justice. I'm also really happy to see uh, many people in the audience that I know, even some of my uh, previous master's students that I've that are now very successful uh, PhD or uh, soon to be postdocs. So it's really great uh, to, to see you. And now you can, you know, do the other way around. Uh, well, I criticized some of your stuff. Now you can do it the other way around. So really excited about that. So this is joint work with uh, a longstanding uh, well, uh, co-authorship uh, and collaboration with Sarah Holbot, who's also here. And we just thought that, you know, it's maybe uh, better for a presentation, just get one person to do it rather than to switch over the ticks away from the, from the content. So um, we, uh, we have been working on the fee on kind of thinking about party strategy for quite a long time. And I'll, uh, through the presentation, I think it also becomes clear that we've developed some of that thinking in this particular book and really grounded it all together. And uh, it is a book that's written also for those of you who are interested in teaching it. It's uh, written in a quite accessible way, and it takes both uh, qualitative case studies as well as quantitative material. It's probably less causal because we're really trying to explain change, but we do have some causal uh, evidence in the book as well. So basically the outset or the reason why we got interested in the topic of challenger parties, and I'll define the terms later on uh, in the presentation, is kind of our ongoing work. Uh, so I'm Dutch, Sarah is Danish, and we have seen many, many new entrepreneurs because we come from, you know, from systems that are particularly permissive for new parties to come in. Uh, we saw many kind of political entrepreneurs or also our own political socialization uh, was probably uh, uh, affected by, you know, seeing a lot of political change. So we've been kind of, I think, interested in this uh, for quite some time. And also what you saw is you saw a lot of parties that, uh, that fit in certain um, um, uh, kind of categories that we know, maybe on the extreme right, they've been going on back and forth coming into politics for quite a long time. But we also saw a rise in, uh, in newer parties. So it's populist right, populist left parties, you know, very different ideological leanings, also green parties, for example. 
So while a lot of our uh, initial work has been focused on challenger parties, as we started to, so on those parties that kind of break through and, and provide uh, political innovation, when we started to kind of work on the book, we uh, wanted to take a longer view of trying to maybe take stock of how we can explain changes in party competition in Western Europe. So the book is focused on Western Europe and I'll come back to explain why that's the case in a minute. Um, and we really started plotting the data. So this is basically uh, vote shares of dominant parties. Those are defined as parties with government experience. These challenger parties are defined as parties without government experience. And we plot them across time. Definitely, it makes sense to focus on these, uh, on these challenger parties in recent times, because we really see that they've been kind of breaking through since the early 2000s or late 2000s. But we've seen uh, actually this period uh, since 1950, so in the post-war period, is also characterized by a lot of continuity. So if we try to understand, you know, challenge parties and why they're successful, maybe we also have to understand this, the sheer resilience of uh, dominant parties and why they've been successful, uh, you know, to keep their dominant position for quite a long time. So it's really trying to understand the interplay of continuity and change in Western Europe. But then also when, when we start to look more deep into differences within countries, what we really see is that the breakthrough of parties that have not yet been in government, so the electoral breakthrough of them, and the, and the degree to which they are successful really differs across countries. So we can think of, for example, an extreme situation, which was Italy after Mani Politi, right, after the Clean Hands campaign, the two big dominant blocs, uh, you know, uh, were, were, tat were tattered in, uh, in, in elections, and we saw a lot of political change. Uh, but we also see systems in which, you know, that change has been much more recent and uh, less, uh, less uh, pronounced, for example, a country like, uh, like Germany. But interestingly, also the cases that, you know, Saar and I are most familiar with, so Denmark and, uh, and the Netherlands, have very similar electoral rules, right? So the breakthrough of parties and, and the kind of permissiveness of those systems is quite, is quite, is quite, is quite um, uh, favorable for challengers. However, the timing and the extent to which we saw these changes differs. So what we're really trying to understand is why that's the case. So a lot of this has been kind of explained through big structural changes. So changes in cleavage structures, right? Some people who are also connected at the UI, for example, Hans-Peter Krizi, uh, also work on, uh, on uh, party system change by Daniele and others. You know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of work has focused on structural conditions and that's clearly, of course, important. We don't want to take away of any of that research. However, what we see is that the degree and timing of change differs. And I think what we're trying to focus on in this book is maybe on trying to understand that through the strategies that parties employ. So providing next to uh, that you have to have a virtual ground that structural conditions need to change. Also the extent to which parties then can use that opportunity by implementing certain strategy or not, or being successful at implementing them or not. So that's kind of the focus of this book. So I think it's very complementary to, uh, to many of the structural uh, uh, approaches. So the key, the questions that we're trying to then, uh, then address in this book, so why have mainstream party families actually been so resilient in the post-war Western uh, Europe? Actually, when structural changes originated already in some countries from the early 60s, right? And it took a very long time for us to see change. Um, so there's much talk about kind of the recent rise of populism, but actually when you look at it, there's a lot of continuity uh, and even probably more continuity and change. And also in the kind of pandemic, we saw a lot of mainstream parties doing well again, right? So, so it's really trying to understand that continuity and change. But then given that mainstream parties actually have been so dominant for quite a long time, why have certain challenger parties been able to then break through and also have been more or less successful at doing that? So there's considerable variation in the timing and the degree of success of challenger parties. And I think those are the questions that we try to address in this book. So, and then, as I said already, your important background story to our book is, is the work on structural conditions. You can think of, you know, uh, Lipset Rockan, Peter Mayer, uh, Hans-Peter Krizi, many, many people also have been associated with the IEY, Lisbeth Hoff and Gary Marx, who have worked on some of these uh, uh, insights. But what we're really trying to do is to try to understand the agency of political parties. So the things that political parties can do in order to be more or less successful. And what we try to do in the book is actually go back to a already tradition within party competition. That's a kind of Downsian economic theory of, uh, of, of party competition. 
but we also criticize uh, it a little bit. I said it in a previous presentation. I was it's been daunting for for people, you know, to criticize the kind of big masters that we always cite in political science. But uh, you know, down, the Downsian model was very much a model of free market competition, and all of us political scientists know that the political market is not a free market of competition, but a, you know has high barriers to entry, and that oligopoly market or imperfect market is what we try to study here. And what we then do is we adapt insights from the study of imperfect competition on the economic market, which is a study called of industrial organization and economics. And we try to address that and, and, and adapt that to uh, political parties. And we also in the book highlight where that analogy really works extremely well and in which points we might have to kind of make some additional assumptions or some additional changes uh, within, uh, within political science. But the core element of this is, is kind of a Schumpeterian idea that if we try to understand economic change, is that what Schumpeter was in, interested in? And we are trying to understand political change on, the, on that market of, of votes and, and, and office, that really the two forces that we need to be understanding is the dominance and the innovation. So the dominant parties and the innovators on that market. While innovators always try to disrupt, dominant players try to protect their power. So you can think about it as a recent example on the car industry, right? So electronic uh, and electric cars developed by Tesla looks kind of futuristic, right? A new product versus a Ford, you know, that was the innovator of a previous time. Fordism, of course, associated with many, many uh, innovations on the, on the car automobile market. And that type of competition that industrial organization describes and the things that are associated, what do certain firms do and what do uh, innovating firms do. That's also what kind of the mold, the theoretical mold that we use in this book. So I already told you, let me just do it like this. Uh, I already told you that uh, we also want to define uh, those terms. So the way we understand the dominant parties, and it's really uh, uh, important uh, uh, you know, to stress the definition, is that those are the parties that like you know, like a Ford on the, on the automobile market that dominate the political marketplace. And challenger parties are those that do not have dominance in the system, but are trying to disrupt the dominance of dominant parties. And while in, uh, in, uh, in kind of on the firm's level, it's often market shares in political science, we know that just, just having a market share that is small can actually also make you dominant on the political marketplace, because what actually creates the dominance is that you are in government and are able to implement the policies that we want to do. So if you think about the product, the product we think of are the policy proposals and the policy appeals that political parties make, and then they can only deliver on that product when they're in government, right? So that's really crucial. And we also highlight in the book that that government experience then changes uh, uh, what parties do, right? So, so that government experience is really crucial in the way that we think about it. Then there's a question of empirically measuring dominance, right? So we can either uh, look at government experience based on a binary, you know, dichotomous variable, like are you in government, are you in government or not, right? And so, and then not here is have you never been in government, right? So having no government experience, or we can think that certain parties that have only been in government maybe once, right, or for a short period of time, think like uh, the Dutch uh, Lisp in Fortuyn, which was only in, in, uh, in uh, government for 80 days and was fighting in government most of the time, right, that, that probably that in and of itself is not enough in order to create some of the changes that we're talking about. So it's also important to think about government experience as a continuous variable, as a share of government experience, which we then define in that post-war period, right? Um, and then the core insight of the book is that these different types of parties, so being dominant or being a challenger, gives rise to different strategies. One, uh, dominant parties, those strategies are associated with trying to protect your dominance, whereas the, uh, for the challenger parties, it's all about innovating strategies. And that's what, what, what the kind of the book uh, uh, talks about. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor, it's, more, you know, it's not so, so easy to kind of totally summarize a book, but I'll try to do it justice. So we make an argument basically in four steps. So one thing I've already highlighted before, we see the political marketplace as an oligopoly. And here we rely on a lot of evidence by uh, many uh, prominent political scientists that argue that the rules of the game, we can think about it in a, in a, in a kind of Duverger way, right, already, that the rules of the game, the setup of how you can enter uh, uh, electorally uh, or, in, or, or also government, that that really crucially uh, affects um, uh, the likelihood of uh, being able to enter that market, right? So it's an oligopoly because the rule of the games favor the dominant players. And the dominant players have no interest in changing those, game, uh, those rules because that's in their interest, right? So think about a boyish uh, kind of argument. 
Another way what we can think about it, also going back to Duverger, is of course the loyalties that voters have to parties. So this is very much the insight from the structural work, right, where we know that these loyalties, the, the kind of freezing of party systems over loyalties has weakened uh, because of, you know, uh, rise of education and women's entry to the market force, uh, decline of working class, et cetera, et cetera, trade unions. Uh, so those loyalties form also uh, can, be, can form a psychological barriers to entry. And then I think a third element that we highlight very much in the book is that actually political parties themselves, so dominant players themselves, can also prevent entry by employing certain strategies. So the oligopoly is also kept in place by the strategies of dominant parties. And then the question becomes, when are they successful and when are they not? And that's what a lot of the book is about. So I'm just going to go through very quickly through those three strategies that we outline for dominant parties. So one is, and this is also, to, you know, of course, building up on a lot of work, uh, 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 you know, that we've, uh, this is especially kind of work also of uh, uh, Stefano Bartolini and, uh, and Peter Mayer, for example, right? So uh, the first strategy is that of distinctive convergence. So what you try to do, which is also kind of a Kirchheim catch-all strategy, uh, provide a policy offering. So that mix of policy proposals that you want to implement in office that fits the taste of most voters but appear to be distinct from each other. So this is some data uh, uh, using uh, the, the Riley measures in the CMP data set, manifesto uh, uh, data set of the left-right positions of kind of the dominant players within uh, German party politics and, and uh, British party politics. And what you see is hardly any what we call leapfrogging, right? So that you go to the other side of the center. So you have a party that's the SPD, that's center-left, uh, CDU, center-right, the same for the Labour Party and Conservative. So you try to appear uh, uh, distinct enough for the voters to see that you're kind of uh, uh, center left, center right, but you try to kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, make be an attractive policy option for as many voters as possible. So this is also a Downsian insight, right? That you try to be like the like the vendors of ice cream on the on the, on the beach, right? Try to uh, situate yourself in the middle so it's uh, you can attract most customers to buying your ice cream. A second strategy that uh, dominant parties can employ is keeping wedge issues off the political agenda, and that we term issue avoidance. So that's actually much more taken from the US literature, uh, people like Carmines and Stimson, for example, who argue that the, that the kind of dominance of dominant players is associated with certain issues in Western Europe that's very much been the left right. This is also one of the reasons why we don't include Eastern Europe in our, in our model because it's more difficult. There's a great book by Tim Houghton and uh, Kevin Deacon Krauss on, on that, on new parties in Eastern Europe. Uh, but you know, like, party competition was actually not necessarily crystallized out that clearly in the period that we're looking at. So what you try to do is to keep wedge issues that can split your constituency or your voters off the political agenda and try to, uh, 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 try to um, uh, um, you know, make political competition focus on the dominant uh, issues that are being discussed. A third element is that, is that uh, uh, dominant parties, because of their governing experience, try to highlight um, their own political experience and their ability to govern. So what they engage in is what we call competence mobilization. Uh, next to uh, positions, parties also can, you know, stress valence or, or their level of competence, and that's also what, what dominant parties do. However, this oligopoly is weakening, as we know from a lot of the structural work. That's the second part of the argument. Voters are increasingly critical consumers. Party attachments is on decline. Party switching between elections is increasing in many Western European countries. Here I have the Netherlands and Sweden as, uh, as examples. So this provides an opening in that oligopoly for challenger parties, for innovation, for innovators to break through. So then the question is not only what do dominant parties do in order to keep their dominance, but what do challenger parties do in order to innovate? And we highlight two strategies. One is issue entrepreneurship, and the other is what we'll talk about is anti-establishment rhetoric. So for an innovation to be worthwhile, we know that from the industrial organization literature, you have to be able to appropriate the innovation. So on the, on the kind of product marketplace, that's to patent an innovation. So you cannot patent an innovation as a political party, right? You can't say immigration is my issue, the EU is my issue. But what you can do is try to extend the, your first mover advantage. You provide the, innovate, the innovation, and in order to reap the electoral benefit of that, you want to kind of be the first mover for as long as possible. So there's two ways in which you do that. First, you choose a high appropriability issue. So you choose an issue, which is exactly the wedge issue, try to mobilize that, that dominant parties want to keep off the agenda. And wedge issues are those issues that split across constituencies and voters in Western Europe, 
So those are things like environment, European integration, immigration. Those are issues that do not sit neatly onto that left-right dominant dimensions that dominant parties you know, have had their advantage on. So that's the high appropriability issue that you try to mobilize. However, even if you, and this is also data from uh, the CNP data set where we see that challenger parties are much more inclined to mobilize or give attention, give salience to issues like the environment, like European integration, like immigration, much less so dominant parties engage in that type of mobilization. However, a dominant party, for example, think about a green party highlighting the environment, a center left a dominant party can always try to copy that innovation when they see that that's successful. Even if it you know, might split their constituency, they might find a way to find to frame that issue in a way that might be beneficial for them. So what, what also innovators, challenger parties try to do is to try to attack the oligopoly through anti-establishment rhetoric. They try to in, avoid the imitation of the innovation by attacking the competence of dominant parties. And that solves actually a two, uh, uh, a suit, like, a, like a, serves a, a twofold purpose. So one, you are not going to be copied, right? Because you're the real deal, the real mobilization of, of the environment. The other are copycats. But remember that dominant parties also tried to close down the political market through competence mobilization. So you can also attack the competence of, of mainstream parties by saying they're out of touch. They're key issues that they haven't really addressed. So yeah, they're managers on the economy, but they're not managing immigration. They're not managing the, man, managing the, the climate crisis. They're not managing European integration well. So what we did is both rely on expert data where uh, it get asked what the importance is of anti-establishment rhetoric. So developed by uh, uh, Ryan Becker, Lisbeth Hoge and, 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 and others. And here we find that challenger parties, uh, you know, according to experts, attach way more importance to anti-establishment rhetoric than dominant parties, right? So that's in line with what we say. But what we do also in order to give you, a, a, you know, a more over time, this is only in one, in one uh, chapel expert survey round, we have developed a, uh, a kind of a supervised um, machine learning approach where we basically create a measure of anti-establishment in, in manifestos. This is uh, data from France where you see that, uh, you know, the, the, the black line is a challenger party, the gray lines are dominant parties. And uh, what we see is with the establishment of uh, Le Pen under the, the father, right? And the greens, we see a huge increase in anti-establishment, which was the great innovation period uh, within, uh, within French uh, 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 political life or political competition, right? So, and we do this for other countries as well in the book. Um, so then you have uh, the dominance, an oligopoly that uh, dominant parties are trying to protect. This oligopoly is weakening because uh, at least uh, the, the, uh, the attachments, the psychological barriers to entry are weakening uh, through voter loyalties, they're weakening. Then there's a window of opportunity for innovation. Challenger parties try to move into that window of opportunity through issue entrepreneurship and anti-establishment rhetoric. And then the question becomes, okay, so what, right? So uh, what's the effect of this? So the book has three parts, dominance, innovation, and transformation. So, and this is a transformation part. So what we show in the book that this then leads to increased market fragmentation. So how we also think about that on the, on the firm level, electoral outcomes become more unpredictable. Here we see kind of decreasing market concentration. This is an average over the, over Western Europe, in some countries, it's been much more stark, the weakening of market concentration, because, of course, barriers to entry, uh, for example, through uh, more permissive electoral rules uh, generate that more. But what we also show is that actually the gain of issue entrepreneurship or, or anti-establishment uh, strategies, innovation strategies, that is disproportionately uh, favoring challenger parties in terms of election shares than dominant parties. So we see electoral outcomes become more unpredictable, and challenger parties seem to be reaping electoral gains from their innovation strategies. So then this also has really not uh, kind of only effects for for kind of the electoral marketplace, but also for governing, right? Ultimately, what, we're in, what we also talk about that the government experience is really important. You can only implement your policy positions when you're in government. And actually what we show in the book is that uh, this is just government formation, but we can show you the same graph in, in, in uh, government duration that actually governments take longer to form and they are more likely to break down uh, 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 within uh, the parliamentary uh, period. Interestingly, so that's kind of on the governability side, right? Uh, that might create instability and it's difficult. Well, I don't have to tell people in Italy, but, uh, but uh, that has done the same for my country, the Netherlands, where we've seen a lot of instability uh, through to challenge, challenger parties' activities. But the other side is that the entry of challenger parties into the system 
has had positive mobilization effects. So we both look at kind of people's feelings of being represented and overall turnout effects. This is data using the electoral calendar of regional elections in Germany, where you at a certain point get challengers. And then, you know, the, the timing of subsequent regional elections is fixed by the electoral calendar. And we look if there is an increase in turnout and mobilization effects after the challenger party entered the scene. And we find increased mobilization. We also find in self-reported survey data that people feel more represented uh, um, um, uh, when, when challenger parties are in, in parliament. However, they're not more satisfied with democracy, right? So that probably also gives you an indication that this anti-establishment sentiment is, uh, is, is mobilized uh, as well. So just to kind of wrap off, uh, I've talked already a lot. Uh, so uh, we then define uh, two principles of political change. One is a principle of contestability. So if market shares are sticky because institutional rules and voter loyalties favor dominant parties, only relatively few votes will be contestable. So therefore innovation is muted. We believe that there's always attempts for innovation in kind of the supporting information to our book, you see, so many parties that you've never heard of that are challenger parties, but that are not successful, right? So the question then becomes on the which conditions are they successful when there is more increased contestability. And we argue that, the inc inc that, that we've seen an increase in contestability very clearly in the post-war period in Western Europe. One, because of the weakening of brand loyalty, which I've already discussed, uh, to uh, dominant parties. Secondly, that actually uh, uh, dominant parties what we talked about, that distinctive convergence also maybe has a downside, is when you look too similar, so it becomes tweedly dumb, tweedly d, uh, and then voters don't see much of a difference between centrist party, think of the third way, movements of social democracy, that becomes little incentive to vote and more increasing, you know, uh, market share potential uh, for challenger parties. And also we highlight that there has been a lot of external events, which has made it very difficult to avoid certain issues. Think of, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, Eurozone crisis in Europe, think of migration crises, think of climate change uh, uh, events happening that really make it very difficult to keep certain wedge issues off the political agenda. So these are reasons why uh, contestability has increased. But contestability alone is not enough to see political change. What we also need to have is successful innovation. So when do we, do we see successful innovation? And I've already mentioned that, right? Issue entrepreneurship, anti-establishment sentiment is the principle of appropriability, the efforts to innovate intensify with increased appropriability when there's enough ability to reap the benefits of, uh, of innovation. And we've also seen increased appropriability in Europe because of external events uh, that when mainstream parties were in power, it's easier than to appropriate that innovation to you and to say that mainstream parties have no competence on that or are lacking experience on that. However, what we also see is that appropriability is more difficult as more political parties, so more innovators get on the scene. So the developments, recent developments in the Netherlands with Forum for Democracy, for example, show that, demonstrate that very clearly. Geert Wilders was the radical right populist party. Forum for Democracy was kind of trying to find its innovation by being even more Trumpian, even more extreme. And that then becomes very difficult because you always have, the com have to have the competition with the other innovator. And then the innovator that, you know, is a more stable force that has really high levels of appropriability that is able to kind of... Uh, um, uh, be seen as the first innovator, you know, carries a lot of, uh, of advantage. So it's also what we, what we kind of highlight is that appropriability probably leads very often to one party at a time and rather replacement of different parties rather than, you know, seeing a lot of different parties on that, uh, on that, uh, that's, that, um, that uh, innovation end. The last slide. Um, so, you know, what does this then mean for the future of European politics? So we outlined three uh, 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 possible scenarios, which we've all seen in different countries, and we can talk maybe in the Q&A about which conditions are more favorable for seeing one over the other. So clearly what we see in many uh, uh, West European countries is fragmentation. So my country, the Netherlands, is also called the Dutchification of politics. So we see challenger parties successfully competing in election, getting larger market share, and actually the market share of dominant parties stabilizing, but at a very low level where you can get many more parties that command a significant share of the votes. And then you get these problems of how do you form a coalition? How do you get a stable coalition? And that becomes very pertinent in these systems. The second scenario is actually one of replacement. So where a challenger party actually overtakes the initial dominant position of a, uh, a market uh, uh, of, of a dominant party. 
uh, that usually really is in a time of shock or severe crisis. It's also Noam Lupu has worked on this in Latin America, right? That there needs to be a serious tainting of the dominant party brand. And one of the countries where we've seen that was Greece uh, during uh, the debt crisis, where PASOK also had became clear that it had not, that there were internal corruption scandals and it also had cooked some of the books, where PASOK basically implodes and Syriza replaces that, that position by becoming the center. Uh, or, or becoming the, the slightly more left of center, but still also centrist position increasingly uh, so. And that's kind of referred to as the pacification of, uh, of politics by the Guardian. Uh, so I just, we just kind of took that term. Uh, the third possibility is a reinvention where you actually see the dominant parties when they face by electoral pressure of challenger parties reinvent themselves. And then often go back to some of the core principles that they had lost. And I think a one good example of that is uh, uh, the change in PSOE, so the Social Democrats in Spain, under Sanchez, who really breaks with Zapatero's third way movement and goes back to more kind of more left wing and more kind of uh, uh, cosmopolitan positions uh, that, that uh, Podemos, the challenger party on the left, forces them to, and then also enters a coalition with the challenger party. So it tries to absorb the challenger party into, into the system. So that's the reinvention scenario is also possible. So the personification of, uh, of politics. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. So this is kind of the book outline, as I said, Dominance, Innovation, and Transformation. We have several chapters on that, several empirics that we provide, and hopefully uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, will spark up some discussion amongst you uh, uh, also to criticize uh, some of the things, but, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Catherine, for your uh, very exhaustive overview of uh, a very interesting argument. Uh, book length argument. So I see a number of hands uh, already raised. Mm. So I will start. Uh, they appear and then they disappear. So it's not making my task very easy. Now they appear again. So let's start with uh, Vincente, please. Hey. Um... Thanks for the presentation. I, I really like the book and the theory generally, so it's very nice to see it presented here. Um, I, I, have, I have a question about the, the very definition of challenger parties, because, because the definition uh, is basically based on whether or not you've been in government or the extent to which you have been. Uh, the very definition changes across time for the same party. And, um, my question is that um, the same thing, I, I think this biases the analysis in favor of continuity to a certain extent. So in the beginning, when, when you show these plots of the challenger parties versus the other ones, I assume that as challenger parties become more and more successful, they're more likely to enter government and hence they switch categories, which makes the, the, the category of the challenger parties themselves go back to, to a small share of the vote. And I think in the, in the analogy that you make with, uh, with economics and you show us the, the electric cars, this doesn't happen because electric cars will always be electric cars, even if, you know, even if at the end of the day they become the, 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 the majoritarian ways by which uh, people move around. Um, and I, I wonder to what extent this cannot have a problem when we want to look at the the consequences of the rise in challenger parties, because um, if one is to do so, one is to look at uh, the success of these parties as, as the, the treatment variable, but the definition of the variable itself is endogenous to the dynamics of the system that are themselves a consequence of the increasing su success of, the, uh, of these new parties. So I wonder how you think about it. But I mean, thanks. I, so I, so I, let I, me take it, Catherine, because you've okay. uh, just so, yeah. uh, to give I can you a drink some break. water. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, thank you for that question. And, and I think Catherine and I can reveal uh, that the first question we always get when we present the book is indeed about um, uh, the definition. And I think it, it's an important question. As you, as you point out, it is a, a dynamic definition we have. That doesn't mean that all or indeed most challenger parties in our analysis become uh, dominant parties. Uh, that's not the case. And 
in fact, most of them remain challenger parties for the whole period, but that does mean they have the potential to become so. And that is, in fact, um, that's entirely deliberate. We think that whereas most definitions are very static, uh, we think the dynamic one is one, uh, and I'll come back to why we think that's important. Uh, it does have, you were saying, that's different from the industrial uh, organization literature. It's not. Uh, you could easily imagine a world where Tesla becomes the dominant player. Uh, in industrial organization literature, it's based on market share. And if we enter a world, which is not uh, entirely unlikely, where Tesla becomes the dominant car manufacturer, uh, then in that case, they would become a dominant and no longer a disruptor. So in that sense, there's, there's the parallel there. So, so why have we, um, just to sort of go a bit, step back, um, why have we taken a particular approach um, to, to classifying uh, parties that we have? Most of the classifications that you will be familiar with from the literature are ideational. In other words, they are based on, um, on either the party family or particular strategy that parties adopt. So you will know McGeats where it's when you, you base your strategy on non-economic, non-class cleavage-based definitions. You will know the Adams and S. Rodell work, which is based on party families. That tends to be more static, but it's also importantly based on what those parties are about. Now, what we were interested in this book is try to explain the strategies that different types of parties adopt. Now, if we start out by defining those parties by the strategies that they adopt, as McGee and others do, that becomes entirely circular. So instead, we take a, a structural approach in a sense, where which is to say, what are their place in the marketplace? And that's again where we borrow from industrial uh, organization. And we say their place in the marketplace pay, depends on uh, their, how close they've been to power and their access to power. And that's our definitional tool. And that's where it's similar again to industrial organization. So it is a fundamentally different uh, uh, approach. Of course, there's a lot of overlap in practice with sort of niche and, and uh, niche and mainstream parties. But, but we do think it's very important because what we're interested in, in is looking is look in, in looking at is exactly the strategies that parties adopt. So therefore, we don't want to start with that. And also, we think that indeed parties can this dynamic element that you don't like. We think it's important because you will have challenges uh, like uh, Macron's En Marche that started off as a challenger. They are very unusual in the sense that he obviously became dominant very, uh, very quickly. But the fact that he is now the president and a majority party in France fundamentally changes, we argue, the sort of strategies that uh, his party can adopt. And that's what we're interested in. So Catherine might have something to add, but but so I understand your criticism, but but it is it's a very conscious choice we've taken to depart from from the existing literature and the way we we approach it. So and, and also I think Vincenzo, we were very careful if you read the introduction, uh, if you read the preface, we also kind of say that we both very comply to kind of experimental or, or or causal thinking. But I'm not entirely sure that in the party competition stuff, that is always that useful. And I'll try to explain to you why. Right, because I cannot run. So what I can do is to say, OK, I utilize the fact that the AFD came in at a certain point that the electoral calendar is fixed. And then I look what the mobilization effect of AFD is. I can do that. But I cannot randomly assign someone's challenger party status. Right. So 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 what, so so party competition. Right. Has endogenous features to it. And I think that, you know, like I cannot change the dynamics. I would love to observe the same challenger party. Half of it, I, 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 I move into government and half of it, I don't move into government. But even those splits where you've really seen that, there's an endogenous element to that split, i.e. some people who wanted to go into government form, you know, think about form for democracy right now. So I see what you're saying, but I think we're also quite, quite open uh, in the book about how far that type of logic can help us to understand some of these dynamics. And I think that became very clear earlier on that, uh, you know, some time ago where I, for example, also did some, some qualitative uh, uh, interviews with uh, the Christian Uni, a Dutch small uh, party. And I got a, you know, I expected this kind of, you know, very ideational uh, approach and I got uh, on, on, their, on their kind of campaign uh, uh, elements and they were talking to me in a Reichian way about how they could upset the dominance of the CDA, right? And I was like, wow, I thought this was a small Christian party that was dedicated to their beliefs, right? And, and I got a very different image from that party. So I think that's made Sara and I talk about what Sara suggested about thinking about it 
diverse in first case of the ideational choices and think about it more structurally. So I think that's what we do actually have in common with some of the maybe things that we that we juxtapose ourselves to being more strategic, but that probably we do have in common if you think about it in a more kind of Rockian uh, world. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We can move on with the next uh, question by Odysseus. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, um, from your presentation, uh, I see and this uh, obvious uh, methodological choice of uh, borrowing tools, um, theoretical tools from economic theory and industrial relations theory. And um, to my eyes, this, this choice has some benefits of um, creating a parsimonious uh, model, explanatory model. But uh, I'm losing some, some nuances between uh, challenger parties. Like if you treat uh, challenger parties as products, then um, I don't see any, any differences between them. Um, this is one, like why, why are you making this choice? Isn't political science literature, more pure political science literature enough by itself to, to explain um, continuity and change um, in uh, Western Europe political systems? Um, the second choice is that the second question is that um, from your presentation, um, I'm having this um, feeling that of, of horseshoe theory in the background, that to an extent, um, far right, far left uh, contenders are more or less the same. They, they adopt the same strategies, so um, we don't, um, we, we explain them by their strategy and not from what they are which lacks some uh, history. Why do we have uh, far right uh, parties in some countries and why not in, in others? What explains their success or their failure? Um, if you could elaborate on these two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, for that question, um, uh, which I think follows on nicely uh, from before. So of course, um, I mean, you're entirely right in saying that uh, in a sense, in some ways we have chosen parsimony over detail, like you could easily have written a whole book and people have written wonderful books about single party families, like the social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, the Greens and so on that traces uh, their development. And, and indeed we read those books and build on them and value them. So it is a sort of quite sweeping book <laughs> in the sense that we take six decades of of changes in party competition. And others have done that brilliantly from a, from a structural perspective, you know, like Hans-Peter Krisi, who's here. Hello, Hans-Peter. And what we are trying to add to that literature is to try and say, what can we bring from an agency perspective? Yeah, so what can we, we add to understand why these parties, some of them become successful, some of them not uh, in, at different times in different contexts over time. So, so you're right that in that sense, we do with our grand narrative, do choose parsimony over, over the detail of, of, of a studying, you know, a single part. But we still think we bring something, uh, this still brings something to understand. First of all, it understands why we've seen this development towards greater fragmentation and the rise of challenger parties um, and, and why it happens in some countries at certain times, why some parties are successful and not others. Um, so just you were mentioning that uh, we treat challenger parties as products. That's not entirely true. They produce products and that sense there is that is the similarity. So, so they as as do dominant parties, the products are their, are their bundle of policies. And what we do with um, uh, and, and but what is a, a fundamental difference? And that's why we have this um, distinction between having been in government and not from the industrial organization is, of course, you can only truly deliver that product when you are in government or close to government party. And that's where there's a difference. And that's why we care so much about government party. If you're Tesla, you can always sell your car, as Catherine was saying, you know, even if you're smaller, if you're Ben and Jerry's, you can sell your ice cream. But if you're the Green Party, uh, a small Green Party, Party, uh, and you're nowhere close to government part, uh, power, it's much harder to deliver that product. So, so they are not products, but they sell it. So, so I mean, I think uh, it's a fair point to say, do we lose nuance? Yes. Um, but what we think we gain is really to understand that these different parties, we might not normally think of, of certain green parties and far right parties and having anything in common. And indeed, they are on many grounds, very, very different. But on certain uh, aspects, they are very similar.
And that comes to uh, that is when it comes to issue entrepreneurship and their anti-establishment rhetoric they use when they're challenges. And we're interested in those similarities. What we also do is show that certain strategies adopted by challenger parties are not very uh, not very successful when it comes to electoral appeal. And let me give you one example. We do have quite a few challenger parties that are just ideologically extreme. So we can think of communists as an obvious example. Um, so they just take very extreme um, uh, positions on the class-based left-right uh, dimension. And what we show in our analysis is that that alone, if not combined with some of the strategies that we discuss, doesn't tend to be a very successful strategy. So we also, uh, again, we acknowledge there are differences between challenger parties, but in terms of what kind of uh, strategies tend to lead to greater electoral success for that type of parties, we do find some similarities. Thanks. Yeah, and I think I would like to also add about it. So I think that we don't talk about it in these terms, but I think I'll, uh, some of the as, as some of the research that, I, that we've highlighted on particular party families is usually important. And as is, and is we also, I didn't have time to go into that, we also have quite a discussion about how we situate ourselves to kind of, you know, more party family literature, uh, to more niche party literature and how we deal with that. But I think there's a couple of observations I want to make to that. So one has become very clear in discussions with my advisors, Lisbeth Hoch and Gary Marx, who often have this sense that parties operate differently than other things, that there's something innately good about parties. And actually, what we're probably trying to do is to take that 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 to take that those the 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 the, the our, our kind of mask off and say that these are also parties that and that maybe has increasingly been the case as they've lost links to some social movements that are very interested in winning elections, right? And that is also something that that you know Peter Mayer has talked about and how that you know so 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 that's one and I, I think that that that's also where we differ a little bit. So sometimes we have the feeling that that also some it might also be that certain people who are more on the left study are more likely to study social democratic parties, so that they want to see nice things into those parties. But we also try to kind of divorce ourselves from the content of that, and I think that's a very strategic choice. I'm not trying to say that people have all these uh, priors, but some in some of the literature when you reread it now, you know that there are these priors in that. And I think the, the other thing that you, that you, that, that you talk about in, in terms of like, is there something about the particular uh, uh, party? Uh, you know, in some countries you do have far right parties and others, others you don't. You know, there's an enormous amount of great work. Elias Dinas is in the audience, one person who's worked on legacies of, of previous regimes and, and so on, and we, and we engage with that. But what you also see is that at a certain point, there is a, there is a, there is a time where political parties are able to, you know, for, Elias's or Vincente's work on norm breaking or so on to work, you need to have a party that enters. So what we are very interested in is what are the conditions under which that becomes successful? And then there's an entire other story about are they long successful? How can we explain that particular rise of this particular party in a particular system? Those are very important questions, but I think what we are trying to say is, so what does a golden dawn Right? Or what does, uh, does it actually have something in common with green parties? And I feel quite strongly about that, that sometimes if I present this, especially to green parties, they feel a bit irritated that I try to say that there might be similar strategies. And I think that also some academics have been maybe too much focused on the ideational differences that we don't see the strategic differences. But this is not to say that we're not aware of those ideational differences. And that's important questions in and of itself. So I hope that. You know, like, so I share a lot of what you're saying, but I, I think there's, there, we can also have some critique about, about focusing on these ideational things and forgetting a lot about strategy commonalities between parties. Anna? Yes, thank you for the fantastic presentation. It's uh, really interesting. I think it's a bit of a follow-up question on this. Um, I wondered what, what role, if any, does identity entrepreneurship play in these uh, innovation strategies? Because, I mean, as uh, Kuga and Marx say, there is this new identity cleavage, but it's not just about uh, issue entrepreneurship on identity, but crafting a story that involves a social identity and a sense of who we are. And it seems to me that um, that's what a lot of these challenger parties are doing uh, beyond the just um, issue entrepreneurship. I mean, in the context of Tesla, maybe this would be, you know, crafting a story of uh, who Tesla is and uh, who the consumers that are buying Tesla are. Thank you, Anna. Nice to see you. Um, so, well, of course, I mean, I will argue again now that Hans Peter is here. It's not just um, <laughs> Gary and, and Lisbeth who've argued that there, there are sort of new dimensions. Uh, and I think what we do uh, um, 
that have been become very important in European politics. And what we do is, in a sense, we add, add a, get, I guess, a kind of uh, Hoover and Marx have a very structuralist approach to this. You know, they sort of say, okay, there's a new, there's an expansion on education, and that's linked to certain socioeconomic uh, groups. Um, and we are not necessarily so much engaging with that directly as saying, well, there still have to be parties that mobilize it. And that's where the theory of issue entrepreneurship comes in. Because when is it that, for example, mobilizing your skepticism, which is again something that uh, Gary and Lisbeth put into their sort of quite all encompassing uh, Galtan dimension or transnational cleavage. Um, that is that is when uh, it can drive a wedge in in between the sort of in in between the dominant coalitions or within the dominant parties. So your skepticism is, is is a good example that we discuss in the book and we've discussed elsewhere of where mainstream or dominant parties often find it difficult uh, to to really uh, campaign on it because they tend to be quite pro-European. Uh, their supporters tend to be more split, so they've had have an interest often in issue avoidance, and that can be exploited by um, that can be exploited by challenges. So that's an example of something that uh, I guess uh, Hogan and Marx would argue is is about identity, and so we argue well that is exactly one uh, an issue where dominant parties find it much more difficult to mobilize, where challenger parties can take. Uh, advantage of that and expand their electoral appeal by basing it. So, so, so that's just one example of an issue that can be mobilized in that way. So I think it's, it, um, it is aligned with that. But what we do, which which they don't do, is sort of argue why is it that certain types of parties find it easier than others to mobilize that particular dimension or that particular issue. Um, so I think that's what what our argument adds to that. Uh, great literature, which they and others have contributed to in terms of how there's a sort of realignment of European politics. And we argue that actually challenger parties have contributed to that realignment. Yeah, and I think also adding to that, I, th I think that that it's also, you know, my worry is a bit about this kind of identity element playing such a great role in, in this. This is a, the question is great. It also reminds me of some of my discussions I've had with Lisbon and Gary when, we, when I was their, their student uh, and, and that I divert a little bit from that. I think that mainstream parties are perfectly able, and we do that in the book, to develop identities. So that, that, was, the, that was the core element of, of what, uh, what, uh, what mainstream parties were about, right? And about creating a brand loyalty. What does it mean to be a Christian Democrat? What does it mean to be uh, a, a liberal? What does it mean to be uh, a social Democrat, right? So, you know, for, for the conditions that, that, that we can outline and, you know, Hans Peter will probably also point towards processes of globalization and, and of, of, of open markets and that that, that, that can, becomes more contentious. I think what in the way that we think about it, but Sarah might, is that we really, that where challenger parties sit is where there's a wedge. So you have the globalization aspect where, a, where a, let's say a Dutch liberal party likes all the market integration, but realizes that some of its constituency has an issue with immigration, which might be associated on the EU with free movement of people, right? So they want free movement of products, they want free moods of goods, that's all fine, but free movement of people. And then uh, that is exactly something that Geert Wilders smelled and was like, okay, I'm going to mobilize that in order to. So then, then for me, question, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Anna comes with the question, like, what is identity versus what, right? I mean, I, there's a lot of work to suggest that people can have economic identities. Identities don't need to be only cultural, right? Identity is your gender. Identity is your so so in the 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 line of being identity and that being about the nation and about, that that is I, I, we don't see that a hundred percent like in in, in but it, it it can play a role. But I think there is why I sometimes have a little bit of an issue with thinking that that's only identity based. If I think about some mainstream parties that mobilize clearly on uh, or have in the past in, in in certain more traditional forms on reproductive rights. I mean, that's what we would think is a very identity concerning element, right? So, so it's a bit the question of where that where that brings in, but that's also a bit the question of how you define identity and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I, I, I think that that's an important difference that we are really focused on that wedge of when and when uh, there's a wedge, then you will see challenger parties moving in. And what that wedge exactly is, is going to be sometimes context and time dependent, right? Uh, but therefore, we take a little bit of a step back again, just to repeat what Sarah was saying, is not actually talk about the content, but more about the, the strategic incentives to do that. But then the ideational choices that parties make can differ and can be context dependent and time dependent, depending on, on, uh, on what they, where they see the, the real wedge lies.
Elías. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hi, Catherine. Hi, Sarah. Uh, great, great project, as as uh, as you know already. But I'm a big fan. I have only one very quick question, uh, also because I think there is more hands uh, in the queue. I like very much the analogy, and it's not it's more than an analogy. I like very much the fact that you're drawing on on on, um, on market research. One specific component of markets, which I think is vital, is very very important, especially of the type of markets that you are interested in, like you know, uh, whether the social democrats have become IBM or have become Microsoft, for example, is that um, probably there is a negative correlation between size and innovation, and that is kind of resolved through uh, buying out, like big companies buy smaller ones. So how does, does that play any role in, can that part of the analogy be transferred into party systems? And if so, how? And if it, how in the sense like, how and, and, and if that could, sort of be used to explain uh, the absence of collapse, I guess, or, or, mm -hmm. or the absence of complete chaos, if at all, if it doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe I, can, I can take this. So, so merging and acquisitions, as you say, right, is a key strategy of, let's say, Facebook buying Instagram, WhatsApp, right? So getting innovation as a big firm through merger and acquisitions. So there has been an example of this in my country. So uh, 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 the CDA merged, right, as uh, different parties. And we're now seeing coalition accords on the left, right? So the PVDA is in a coalition, going into entering a coalition accord with the Greens. So they, I mean, not maybe formally, but they've now said this, and we've seen that in, in Dutch history. So that probably is as strong as you can get to an analogy of, mar of, 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 uh, of merger and acquisitions. The other thing what you see is that if a party splits, for example, an innovator splits, you see that some of these uh, parliamentarians go back to a main or co-opted into the mainstream party. So that can be another one. But for full merger and acquisitions in the same way as you have on the, on the market is of course difficult, right? Because, because there, is a, there, 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 are, there are kind of different organizations, but nonetheless, we've seen it sometimes. I think the other question that you ask is a, is a core question in kind of industrial organization, right? What about size, right? And there we have Arrow and there we have Schumpeter. And Schumpeter is all about you get innovation through big size. Clearly, that is not entirely what you find in, uh, in and, and then Arrow says, no, actually, when the size becomes too big, the party starts mobilizing on, uh, uh, or the company tries to, tries to keep its dominance and tries to actually, that is actually a barrier to innovation. And that's a big discussion. We highlighted in the, in the, in the, in the conclusion, we don't take a normative standard at the beginning, but we highlight it through. So I think what we find is that probably the answer is somewhat in the middle. So of course, if you have a, a larger group, you can sometimes, uh, uh, if, you if you're a larger mainstream party, it's, you probably have more personnel and more money and more organizational capacity to bring in a new issue to try to see if you can co-opt a challenger. So in that way, it can be forced innovation in the kind of Schumpeter in sense. But what we do not find for the reasons that we've outlined is that because the oligopoly is on the left-right dimension, we would not have the expectation that Schumpeter does, that he then says, oh, you invest in R&D and therefore you become the innovator, you become uh, the, let's say, Apple, right? Rather than Microsoft and, uh, and, and so on. So there is probably where the market analogy works that can work on the computer market because you can have different products. You can start an iPhone, you can start an iBook, you can start different things, whereas in politics, it's, you, it's more difficult to kind of be pro and anti-abortion at the same time to be, you know, that you have to have some consistency there. So what we basically argue is that probably it's somewhere in the middle, but if, I, if you really put a gun to my head, probably it, if I read, I mean, sorry, if we read the conclusion, we're probably more arrow that we think that, in a, that because of the fact that the dominance comes from the left-right issues, you'll not see as much issue entrepreneurship of those parties because of the problem that it creates splits, that there were ideological selection into the party on the basis of the left-right element, and that probably size does not spur off innovation, but actually becomes a hampering effect to, to innovation with a small caveat that if you have more personnel and more organizational capacities, you can try more things. But it's not been the focus of the book, but we discussed it explicitly in the conclusion. So a great point. I have now Stephen. Hey, good afternoon. Um, well, first, I'd like to, to echo the comments already made. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, and the book, I think, is um, theoretically really well developed. Um, and I'd like to focus on the final slide, which was the future scenarios. 
my first question is, so you have fragmentation, replacement and reinvention. So my first question is, to what extent are they exclusive or can we see more than one occurring at the same time? Because the example of um, PSOA seems to fall under fragmentation and reinvention. And my second point, which I think is more substantive, is to what extent can you make a causal claim that mainstream parties um, reorient their position in response to challengers? Because you have the example of Spain, but correct me if I'm wrong, I think um, Pedro Sanchez was elected party leader in 2014, which is the same year which Podemos became a political party. So I think it could be quite difficult to make a causal claim that the election of Sanchez and the reorientation perhaps to a more left-wing position of PSOA was in response to Podemos, in response to the rise of the challenger. And I think historically and also nowadays, um, we have examples of parties which reorient and change their positions in the absence of challengers. So perhaps the story is actually that challengers are responding to public opinion um, or institutionally, um, the particular elites or interactions with trade unions are actually more causal in the position which a party finally takes than the story is that they're responding to the position of a challenger and some sort of deterioration in their vote because of the rise of the challenger. Thanks. Thank you for that, Stephen. That's great. I mean, first of all, I don't think, just to take the last part, I don't think Catherine was trying to make uh, a causal claim uh, in that last uh, bullet point. I think what we were trying to speculate at the end of our book, well, where does that take us? What what does the future bring? Which is, I think, almost by essence, uh, in essence, when you try and look out in the future, not something you'd want to do with any sort of strong causal claim. So, so that's... Uh, so I think that's the answer to your second question. But let me um, say a bit more about it. I think you, you're right in saying that those three different scenarios are not mutually uh, exclusive. I think what's interesting um, is in terms of the fragmentation, I think is the one where we are quite certain that this is something that is unlikely to cease to exist. And the reason for that is in the underlying conditions for the oligopoly that we identify. So as you will know is that a lot of the party competition, rational choice party competition that you have taken as a starting point that uh, we are operating in a fairly sort of free market, um, that, uh, that is very easy for parties to operate, uh, uh, enter and operate and thereby attract voters and we take we question that in this book and we say no in fact there are these barriers to entry and there are these structural advantages for dominant parties but what we also argue is that those are weakening and declining and as a result of that um, even while some challenger parties might become dominant it is just harder now to be a dominant party and retain that position than before so i don't disagree with your second point that, that there can be other reasons that uh, mainstream parties uh, reorient their position and of course uh, we think that a lot of that reorientation uh, is strategic you know there's no reason for a, a, a dominant party if they're doing well they're in government they're attracting a lot of votes uh, to to change their position but if they're losing vote and that can be of course a, a combination of demand factors and the mobilization of that demand by a challenger party so so in the book we're not trying to make a sort of very narrow cause or claim that it is exclusively in response um, to challenges. Uh, what we the claim we do make, however, is that it is hard uh, for, for dominant parties once an issue or where to have been mobilized to then be as electorally successful from it as it was from the challenger. There is a kind of uh, first mover advantage. Uh, you can think of an issue like uh, anti-immigration or Euroscepticism and so on. So it's not it's not straightforward. You can say, oh, this looks popular. We can just go in. So, so we do make that uh, observation. So, so, you know, no, no, definitely. I mean, I didn't want to make a causal claim necessarily, although I do not see the Spanish situation exactly the same as you. I mean, Sanchez came into the leadership in 2014, was contested straight away, right? There were, there were the, his, uh, the election of the leadership in 2015. Uh, also, the, the thing is, we have to think about when does Podemos start, right? So the social movements were way before 2014. Uh, Pessoa knew that that was there was critique coming from then. So I mean, I think a lot. I mean, it's difficult to prove, right? But a lot of the qualitative reading is that 
you know, the kind of action would be, would Pessoa have taken that choice if Podemos was not pushing them to the left, right? And then, you know, some of my uh, good Spanish friends have the interpretation that, that Podemos played a role in that, but we don't know 100%. And also, Pessoa, you know, Sanchez is not known to necessarily have been the most left-wing uh, uh, candidate, right? So people have been surprised about uh, some of the moves that he's made. And I think that that was partly a uh, scene of, of how popular some of Podemos' uh, uh, positions came. But, uh, you know, like, so I, I think we should not look necessarily at the dates, right? It's a bit more complex of a story. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but you know, you're, you're totally right. I mean, um, uh, we say also explicitly in the book, it's very difficult to take out the chicken and the egg from, you know, from public opinion. This is very much a story about supply, right? But we have worked a lot on demand, right? About how political parties are reacting to demand. And that's always tricky to, to really disentangle. But I do think that, uh, that what we are trying to kind of get more of a sense of is that there is a strategic interplay between parties and that's kind of coming back to Vincenzo's point about the dynamics. And these dynamics have an implication and an imprint on the strategies that parties take. And also, for example, on how a mainstream party or even our case, a dominant party responds to the electoral success of a challenger, for example. And you can think of the similar situation as UKIP gaining a lot of votes, right, in European parliamentary elections, and the Conservatives Party is feeling a need because this was internally dividing their own country, uh, their own party, even though UKIP didn't have any seats, right? So, or, or only uh, when, when you had the Essex, uh, well, the guy that, I can't remember his name, Doug, yeah, anyway, anyway sorry, but left British policy very quickly, you know, moved to UKIP, but they didn't win a seat in and of themselves, but that nonetheless moved, has been one of the contributing factors, and David Cameron says it himself in his biography, right? That, uh, that that was one of the moving factors about that he felt he needed to do something. So I, I, I think it's difficult, as you say, to really establish that causally. But, you know, we have quite a lot of qualitative evidence to suggest that this is a this is a part of the story and also about the memoirs of political parties and how they or of leaders and how they try to defend their choices, if you will. Claudiana is next. Yes, thank you for this very interesting book. I really followed it very carefully. Uh, the, your book really brought me back to the publication of Albert O. Hirschman, Exit, Voice and Loyalty of uh, 1970. Even after 50 years, this book of Hirschman is too much contested. So prepare for your book to be contested, but no matter, it will, you will get famous in political sciences. I'm summarizing the critics of uh, Hirschman's book. Uh, in, pol in political sciences, uh, scholars' point of view, um, the political, the, the political economic, uh, e economics theory could be true only if we consider citizens as consumers, not as citizens in, in themselves. So, uh, my my issue my fear is that uh, maybe have you ever thought that with this book you are somehow um legitimizing the the already emptiness of the this challenger party's rhetorics and this already uh being be, uh, being away from ideology and values of the of the mainstream parties don't you think that this is too neoliberal and this in in a way it is going to your your book could contribute further to this emptiness of message thank you thank you so much for that for that profound point and also thank you for uh, for comparing uh our book to Hirschman and the debate. If we still are debated in that way and criticize in 50 years, uh, I think we will take that as a, as a sign of success. No, but, but more seriously, I think, I mean, it's an important book and it says, do we devalue a point that you're making? Do we devalue what partisan, parties are about and what citizenship and participation in politics is about? Um, because we do argue, uh, interesting, I mean, we also do, if, if you read the book, you will see that one of the things we're arguing that is in effect a barrier to entry and the source of dominance is the attachment, the psychological attachments that voters have to parties. So, and we argue that that's something you find to a much lesser extent in the market. 
Um, so this idea that you can be attached to a certain parties, you have grown up, you're socialized into in a sort of social democratic family, for example, and, and you take uh, that psychological attachment with you to the voting booth. So, so we do very much base our uh, the, the story on that as well. But we argue that that's weakening. So in a sense, voters are becoming more like consumers. And you're saying, does that mean that we are sort of uh, legitimizing an emptiness? I think there's also a different view you could take on that. And that is, is it so bad if voters are acting more like consumers? In other words, evaluating the parties and what they're providing. Certainly it's much closer to a kind of normative model of accountability. And even a mandate where you actually evaluate the mandate uh, and you see retrospectively then is that mandate been fulfilled and you are searching for parties that provide something rather than I think rather blindly in a sort of very deep partisan model just vote for the same party over and over again. I mean partisanship can be a very powerful force but I think what we're seeing right now in American politics is it is also potentially a deeply destructive force in politics because voters will take anything that comes from their party leaders as given. So in a sense, the normative message uh, of one where voters are more critical consumers and less sort of partisan sheep, we have this parallel with IC, I think it's not one where it is, uh, I mean, from, from my point of view, it's not one where a, a sort of a deep partisan model of politics where voters are so much psychologically attached to parties that they cannot see what they're providing, how they're performed, is necessarily one that's normatively desirable. As you say, that's not sort of the main message of the book, but, but I think it's an important debate to have. And I think we're right now, again, in, in the United States, seeing some of the limits to partisanship, because what we've not seen in the United States, what we've seen in Europe is, of course, this decline in partisanship. And I, I don't think you would think a lot of consumers in the US right now are acting as rational consumers. Would it be better if they did? Well, perhaps. I think there is a dark side also to, to the kind of uh, that model. So, so I, I mean, again, it's not the sort of main message of the book, but I think it's an extremely important point and interesting discussion to have. Uh, and one that I would love to have with, with this sort of clever political theorist in this room, uh, of which I don't count myself, but, but certainly one that's not obvious that the more rational economic model is one that's eco that is normatively less desirable. And I think neoliberalism, I'm not sure where that comes into it, but that's sort of... <laughs> so so, so I, I think your question is, is very interesting, right? So I, 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 this is not a, a book about uh, demand. So this is not a book about describing voters. So in that, and there's enormously important real work uh, done in that in that way. And we're we're trying to kind of uh, uh, develop more of a supply story. So some of the kind of critique about how so having done a lot of in-depth interviews with political parties, well, you know, sometimes you can have the feeling is how committed political parties are to positions, right? I mean, in, that it becomes really much a game. So. So, you know, that, that, that we might think is good, is bad. I don't have really a, a, a normative view on that. I'm just saying that that's what a lot of the information we got from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, kind of informants. The interesting element is, is that actually Peter Mayer, for example, I think would, would have turned your argument, but he would have turned it the other way. He would have probably said that quote unquote cartel parties, so the parties who are in what Sarah is describing, so those that are the managerial class that has these traditional links to the, that actually the void comes from them, right? It doesn't come actually from the challengers who are mobilizing certain issues that people really care about to the extent that we have to be careful if they don't infringe on people's rights, right? Or minorities' rights. I share that, that, that type of concern. But his argument would probably very much be that, that, that uh, actually what mainstream parties do is they don't provide a choice for voters. So irrespective of how you view parties in and of themselves, I think Peter doesn't take a, so much of a stance there, but he talks about how, how the content of party competition and the way parties organize can have a mobilizing or demobilizing effect. And actually that is an idea that we take up. And what we show in, in kind of the, the transformation chapter is that actually the, the entering of these uh, challengers into the political arena actually increases mobilization and so on. So irrespective of how you wanna view the voter and model the voter, what we actually show is that is that 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 uh, that uh, the entry of those parties has a mobilizing effect. You might not like what they're you know the positions that they're putting forward, but that's a different story, right? That's a that that's a, a kind of a normative evaluation of the content of their of, of their of their appeals. But in that way, I think it's a very com you know it's it's a very complex story. The other element is of me as a public opinion scholar. So 
it's also a right not to participate in politics. I mean, that, that like if you want to just kind of only participate in election time, right? I mean, that is, so we don't only have to be Tocquevillians and be strong, you know, participants. That might be a normative ideal that we have, but for voters, that's, so I think there's a lot of questions associated and assumptions that we need to be very critical about. But I just want to make clear that, that in this book, we focus on, on the supply dynamics and how they affect voters, right? Not so much on uh, a theory of voters and what we think should normatively be the ideal of voters and so on. And I think the one last thing I want to say, which is maybe more normative, in the last chapter of the book, where we uh, cite kind of qualitative evidence that comes from the Dutch case, what we do show is that if you have already some, uh, some innovation on the extremes, that if in order to provide more in innovation, so for example, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, that you want to kind of become a party, right of that party, you have to go quite extreme. And that is also now happening with Forum for Democracy, where there's now issues about, you know, anti-Semitism, you know, and element, elements, and that creates real problems. So sometimes innovation can push to the boundaries of a rule of law and minority rights. That definitely, I mean, we, we're, that's also what we warn for in the book, right? So in the sense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, I believe in freedom of speech and political parties should be willing to, uh, to, to articulate issues, but that needs to be within the rule of law, right? And it needs to be within what's legal to say and not, right? And, you know, in some countries, like in Germany, that is legislated by party, but I forgot what's certain English, anyway, that, that you cannot, uh, uh, that you can ban a party. In the Netherlands, that's not allowed, right? In certain other systems, that's, that's not allowed. But there is, of course, some, yeah, I think the, where the normative element comes in is, is, is the extent to which when, when a supply of political party reaches the boundaries of, of rule of law and minority rights. But the question is, uh, is, is very, 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 you know, points very well taken and, and very interesting question, thanks. So we have three more um, uh, people on the, on the list. Uh, Catherine, I remind you in three minutes you wanted to, but maybe you can take this last uh, one before you leave. And then, and then we have two more. Yeah. Um, uh, Hans Peter. Yeah. I wonder whether you can separate the ideational and the strategic element as you seem to do. And I react uh, specifically to Catherine who said, uh, Wilders, he smelled that there was an opportunity for him to go into. Now, I think Wilders is an ideologue. Uh, and I take this view because I read a biography by Mandat Fenema over Wilders and I had a Dutch student who uh, studied the PVV. And Wilders doesn't care about uh, old age pensions, for example. There he can uh, act purely strategically, but he cares a lot about Islam and uh, uh, about uh, multicultural uh, society being uh, undermined by Islam and by immigration. So these ideologues are not purely opportunistic entrepreneurs and it is not by chance that they go into this and not another uh, opportunity. How would you react to this? No, no, I, I, I see that that's a really important discussion. The problem also with mine, it has a particular, I actually disagree on some of the elements of mine's book. He knows that we discuss also that, but so if you read earlier things, right? Uh, Geert Wilders was the personal assistant of Bo Bolkestein and he married uh, someone of, of, of Hungarian descent. He had a lot of friends among him that were, that, that were uh, open Muslims, right? So he, earlier on in his career, he clearly didn't have so much of an, of an issue with that. He started his political party on the EU, not on, on, on the, 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 the issue of, uh, that, that was the kind of core elements. I agree with you, Hans Peter, very much that he radicalized. He radicalized when he said certain things, especially we think about the association he had with Ayan Heshi Ali, that when she had the, the threats against him, he radicalized. But at that moment in time, he had already introduced, you know, he started in, in with his own group earlier on, right? So I, I think it then becomes very difficult to distinguish what is what. He clearly saw that being EU, being anti, 
uh, Muslim, but then also being anti-Polish, where he married a Hungarian previously, he had said that he loved Poland, that at a certain point that became a, 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 a strategy. So I think that there can definitely be, Hans-Peter, I, I don't think someone who is cosmopolitan left is going to start a, a anti-immigration anti, uh, party. Of course, there are some ways in which it, people might choose into this, but I think that strategy plays a huge part in, in this as well. And it's very difficult, of course, to disinfect. And I think the in-depth interviews I did in the Netherlands, of course, I could not do any in-depth interviews with the PVV because they refused to do that, right? But with the SPA, with the, with the Christian Uni, with other challenger parties in the Dutch system, what I already said about the Christian Uni, now, by the way, a dominant party, there was only strategy what you heard from them. And I was like, but you're a small Protestant party. I mean, you're from the area I'm from. You know, I was raised as, as a quite uh, strict Protestant and there was nothing left of that, of that story. You have parts in that party, of course, that are ideological, but you also have people who want to gain, you know, who want to gain access to parliament, who want to get resources, who want to get jobs. And for Geert Wilders, it was clearly strategy because if he would have left parliament and the VVD wanted to get rid of him, right? Because they thought he was too, who, he was so extreme on the EU. Eh? That was the main issue. He would have lost his job, Hans Peter. He, he had nothing else than being a politician. He'd never had another job. So I think that you're right. Of course, he has some ideological affinity with certain positions, you, you're right. But, the, but, he, but he, I think a lot of the story as to why he started the party and how he, did, he smelled an opportunity for him to develop a party and to gain also more, more grandeur and to be the leader of the party, not seeing the second, the second uh, in Dutch we say second fiole, the second fiddle to someone else. And also then radicalized as he, especially in his connections with uh, the end uh, with, uh, with, with Ian Hishi Ali. So I'm not saying I 100% I disagree with you, with you, but I, I do think that that strategy is an important part of this story as well. And I mean, Geert Wilders, I know better than some of the other entrepreneurs, right? But think also about a country, uh, you know, think about uh, another uh, political entrepreneur, uh, for example, a now uh, uh, dominant like uh, Emmanuel Macron, who wanted to, you know, be, uh, secure his future in politics. The other thing would be, you know, someone like, uh, like Berlusconi in Forza Italia, right? So, so, so you, I think strategy plays a part. Of course, you're right. There might be some affinity with the issues you choose that I don't think that, that a person on the left is going to mobilize necessarily anti-Semitism or the other way around, right? So, 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 so there are some boundaries, but I think strategy should not be underestimated. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you. Catherine? Um... Yeah, and thank you guys. I'm going to do another presentation on the book, but somewhere else. So yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for being with us. Thank you for the question. Good luck for the next presentation. Yeah, bye. Um, okay, now, Sarah, you're on your own answering the questions. We have two left. Uh, Kasia. Yes, hi, Sarah. Um, and th thank you very much for this very inspiring um, piece of work. I have two questions um, following also on the, on the discussion that we've been having. And so the first question is, um, you say that we see challenger parties where we see wedges. And I am interested to know, or was it Catherine saying this? Anyway, that's the statement that she mentioned during the discussion in any case. And so I wanted to better understand this dynamic of, of these wedges, by which I guess she means opportunity. So when there is opportunity, that's when you're going to see a challenger party who that is going to be more or less successful. And so um, to better understand this dynamic, I was wondering whether whether you have measured these these wedges, that is, you know, the timing of their appearance or maybe characteristics as in like what, you know, potential topics um, they would open up, etc. And please excuse me this question if you if you bring it up in the book already um, uh, because I've only browsed it so um, so excuse me for this. And then in the second question is that you know if I think about this I guess that a challenger does not need to be a party necessarily but could also be a leader. Um, since we have seen of course leaders who have you know mobilized around new let's say this wedge issues right and then also position themselves as you know different than the party elite or you know established elite um, an example here would be would be for instance Donald Trump um, and so I am wondering whether this is a potential strategy that parties 
could or mainstream parties could um, could utilize? And if so, would that be to, in response to the wedges or would that be in response to the challenger party themselves, right, first? Um, and the second question is whether maybe, you know, how often does that happen? Maybe it's just an outlier, you, maybe US is just an outlier whereby, you know, being structurally, let's say, um, constrained, you know, because of the party system. Thank you so much. Great question, sir. Thank you so much. Um, just to, to start from the end. So we do in the book, we treat mainly parties as a unit of analysis. And that doesn't mean that there's not very important work to be done on the sort of factions within um, parties. But the, one of the reasons we do it is that, of course, most of Western Europe, which is the region we deal with, um, you have more permissive electoral systems where you often, when you have very deep splits within parties, you tend to get fragmentation. Um, now, of course, the US and the country that I live in, the UK, uh, with majoritarian electoral systems, there is such a great disincentives against starting a new party. So we have seen uh, recently in the UK, you mentioned the example of, of the Republican Party in the US, that's of course an example. Uh, I think uh, most party and US observers would agree that if you'd had a PI electoral system, you would have Trump running his own electoral campaign and you'd have a sort of more mainstream a center right party. Similarly, in the UK, you would definitely have a radical right wing party and you would have had a center right party. Similarly, under Corbyn, you would definitely have had a radical right wing, a left wing party and a more centrist party, so on. Yeah. So I think this is really more, you see that more this kind of mobilization and this sort of takeover from within in these first, which you also hinted at. Uh, whereas what we tend to see, and Catherine was mentioning the example of the Netherlands, is when you have these kind of deep divisions within parties in systems that don't incentivize it, you do have split ups and you have this fragmentation. And so that's the reason. So it's not to say this is not an, an interesting point of view, but we do in this book treat parties as um, uh, as a unit of analysis, uh, although uh, we, of course, look at the role that leaders have in, 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 in starting this sort of issue entrepreneurship. But I think there's a, an important book to be written just on, on the kind of what happens within parties. I, I think that's right. In terms of wedge issues, I mean, our starting point is the dominant parties have been successful uh, on the dominant dimension of contestation, whatever that is. Often in European, West European politics, it's been structured around left right politics. And they have an incentive in continuing that being because that's where they are seen as sort of to borrow from the, from the language of issue ownership. That's where they're seen as the competent issue owners. They have an advantage. They've been successful in that dimension. Wedge issues uh, are therefore issues that tend to not be uh, uh, neatly aligned with that, uh, with that dimension, whatever that is in a particular system, and therefore have greater potential to drive a wedge either within parties, dominant parties, or within the coalitions that we see form. So there's a natural kind of alliances coalition formed around left-right politics, also amongst partisan supporters. We have social democratic supporters naturally aligning around the idea of more government intervention in the economy, greater public spending, greater redistribution, and so on. And that's how those coalitions have been formed. Whereas when new issues come, such as, uh, and we, we discuss explicitly the issues of your skepticism, immigration, and the environment, but you could imagine more. So we don't have um, uh, a kind of very detailed empirical measurement of that, but that's how we think about it conceptually uh, in terms of what, what wet issues are. And you can imagine in different contexts. I mean, an, an interesting example are now you've seen challenger parties cropping up uh, on the COVID lockdown issue. Now, of course, I think they will have a very short lived existence because, uh, because if we're going to have a vaccine, <laughs> uh, that's not going to work. But you could, you could imagine that if we didn't have a vaccine and this was going on for years, that would be interesting. It's not neatly aligned to the dominant dimension of contestation. And Mr. Issue Entrepreneurs overall, Nigel Farage in the UK, he's exactly wanting to create this new reformist party on the sort of COVID issue. Again, I don't think this one would be a success, um, but, but you could imagine that if this, had, this were to go on for years and years, it would be. So, so all sorts of issues can be wedge issues in that sense. Alina, for the last question. Yes, thank you. Uh, it is great to see you again, Sarah. I, I very much uh, enjoy the project and uh, it is very well thought. So um, I, uh, I, I have a very specific question linked to the theory. 
Um, and I, I, I enjoyed very much the comparison between uh, economic markets and, and political markets. Um, what I would say, uh, my impression is that economic markets are to a large extent global markets, whereas uh, political markets are um, still very much national markets. So my theory, uh, my question is, um, should we interpret uh, the theory of, of change exclusively in, in a national lens uh, based on, on national dynamics? Or is there a place for some diffusion between countries in terms of how issue entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial strategies can be, can be learned for, uh, by one party in a country from, uh, from another party in, in another country, or maybe even extending at the European level within the European party families? Nice to see you too, Alina, and thanks for that question. I mean, I love that point you're making, and of course you're right, that we still think of party systems uh, and they operate very much domestically. And, and from that, they distinguish themselves fundamentally from most companies. I, I agree with you that. I do think there can be learning effects uh, and diffusion. There is some literature on it. We know from you know Lawrence Esper and others on these learning effects. Um, and and uh, and it's not something we engage with, like it's not something we test empirically. But I think we can certainly see anecdotally, for example, on the radical right, that when something has been uh, successful, um, uh, they can, you know, learn from each other either through, I mean, of course, the European Parliament, what they do is actually provide a sort of institutionalized form of learning. And again, there is some literature in that. So, so I do think that can exist. Um, and also, we, we've now seen with the decline of social democracy, often whenever there's a social democratic party, we know that we have workshops and others in social democratic parties and think tanks thinking, oh, could we, you know, should we now move to the right of immigration like the Danish social democrats because they, uh, they did it and so on. So, so I do think that happens, especially in a context like the European. And it's certainly interesting to do further research on that where parties not only are closely geographically, but also where they actually often work together in political groups in parliament and so on. So I, I think that can certainly um, uh, be a case. And I think it's a great point. I wouldn't argue that it's one we have hugely contributed to. But again, if you think of, 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 of of parties a bit like, you know, uh, issue entrepreneurs, they are also of course interested in looking at what is the competitors doing in this sense, it's not a direct competitors, but certainly some that they can learn from in other countries. So that's a great point. Thanks for that. Very good. It is past 2 p.m. now and the seminar comes to an end. Thank you very much, Sarah and Catherine for a stimulating and very engaging session on your new uh, book. It has been a true pleasure to have you and I'm very grateful to both of you for making it possible. And thank you everyone for attending and for the lively discussion. Well, thank you for, for inviting me, Daniela, and thank you for these amazing, uh, amazing comments and questions. And I just wish that, that we were with you in Fiesole and we could all like have wine for lunch, which uh, doesn't happen <laughs> in my part of the oh, world sure. and look oh, at the beautiful sure. view. So, uh, so I'll yes. be bugging you to come back when we're all vaccinated. But uh, thank you so much for those great questions. Many thanks to you. We reconvene in two weeks for another book presentation with uh, John Eric Fossum and Josef Batora on their book on segmented the European political order. Hopefully see you, many of you uh, then for another uh, interesting session. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again. <laughs>